Jason and Kendra Shine are uh, the co-founders of uh, MORE, M-O-R-E. I assume you'll tell us what that's about. A nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering historically marginalized communities through entrepreneurship, innovation, and real estate investment. Uh, yeah, that sounds awesome. That's just what we said we wanted to hear about when we were given <laughs> our topics that we like. So Kendra uh, is uh, one of the co-founders. She's back in the back there uh, with their other project, uh, four projects uh, that you can see. Uh, <laughs> it looks like a very successful project. Um, and uh, she has a visionary spirit, boundless creativity, relentless work ethic that began with a BS in education of the deaf and hard of hearing from UNC Greensboro. And uh, her early years uh, as an inspiring teacher led her to a successful career as a realtor and entrepreneur. She is now executive director of Moore. Uh, Jason, uh, who's the other co-founder, is going to be speaking to us, is the COO. And he has a rich background as a former realtor, business coach, and online course creator. Uh, and so I am not going to go on any farther. You can see the full bio on our website. And I want to give all the time to Jason and Kendra to be able to share their vision, what they're doing with us. Thank you for bringing them here, Lisa. We appreciate you sharing them with us. Over to you, Jason. So when you combine opportunity and thriving, you get part of the mission of More Inc. And you can see it on the screen here, curating the circumstances that make going from surviving to thriving possible. So I'm going to talk from that vein as I present our background as well as um, how More got started. So again, I'm Jason Shine. I'm the COO of More Inc. And I want you to take a journey back about 10 years with me. So Moore was founded in 2022 as an official 501c3, but that was not the origin story of Moore. So we were back uh, in 2013, I think it was, we were, uh, we were brand new realtors in Old Town Alexandria. So we we're from Washington, DC. So we decided we would get our real estate licenses and start practicing real estate in an area that we were not familiar with. We didn't have connections there. And we had no background in Old Town Alexandria. In fact, when we crossed the bridge over, or the GW Parkway over into Alexandria, we didn't know where we were. Uh, we didn't know King Street from Duke Street from Queen or whatever else. <laughs> so we found ourselves getting lost and we had to learn the area. And imagine starting a business. We we're brand new in real estate, starting a business and having to learn both real estate law as well as learning the dynamics of a place called Old Town. So you can imagine it was sort of a, uh, an interesting experience for us. And hopefully Kendra will give her uh, uh, perspective as well. So we were in an office there where uh, there weren't many people that looked like us. We were 24 and 25 years old, and we were in Old Town, Alexandria. So we were the youngest, the darkest, and we, st <laughs> we stuck out like a sore thumb. So we, we used that to our advantage because we attracted a lot of attention uh, and people were just curious, well, what, are they, what are they doing here? Are they even old enough to be licensed to be real estate agents? We got that question a lot as well. Um, I think I still look a little bit young now, but I looked a whole lot younger then. So I looked about 16 years old. Um, so we were working, we were sitting in our office one day and we were um, thinking about how are we going to grow this business? How are we going to get leads and how are we going to um, get to the goals that we want to achieve? And we realized that when we looked around us, we didn't have a few of those circumstances that makes it possible to thrive. Didn't know that then, but now looking back, we can see that pretty clearly. And so that was actually the genesis moment for what we called at that time more in America. So we're from uh, Banneker High School. That's our alma mater in, D mater in DC. Uh, we both graduated in the class of 2001. So we decided we were going to take our limited experience in entrepreneurship and we were going to apply that to doing something beneficial, bringing more opportunity to high school students in Washington, DC. So we didn't have a 501c3. We didn't have any donations. We didn't have any grants from anyone. We just took the money that we were able to earn through commissions and we started sewing it into this organization. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm a little bit off of the, uh, the schedule here, but um, so we poured into this organization 
And we were able to um, gather a group of high school students at Banneker, uh, three of which continue with our program throughout their course at Banneker, uh, one of uh, which is now, um, I think he's at U University of, uh, he's at Penn, Pennsylvania State University, um, and he's got a full scholarship. Another is at George Mason University. So all of the, uh, the kids in our program were able to get scholarships, and now one of them has come back, and he recently started his own real estate business. So it's kind of full circle for us. Um, so the more, it stands for four key components to thriving and, and to opportunity, those characteristics. So the first M we realized that we didn't have as we were building our business was mentorship. We didn't have someone who would walk the path that we were walking. So we wanted, we knew we needed to have mentorship as a component that we offered to inspire aspiring youth who wanted to get into entrepreneurship, wanted to get into development, wanted to have a more abundant life. The other was opportunity. Now, back then when we came up with the name, I didn't have this, this understanding of opportunity that I have now, but for us, it meant access. It meant a seat at the table. It meant um, the ability to showcase their talents before people that could give them uh, open doors of access as well. And then the R stood for, um, <laughs> so we had mentorship, we had opportunity, and the third was resources. So the R stands for resources. So as we were growing and developing this business, we knew we needed marketing, but we didn't have a marketing budget. So our market, marketing budget was us cutting uh, construction paper and putting together our own flyers that we could drop off. The last uh, of the more, the E, at that point was education. Knowledge is power, as we all know. So that has evolved over time, and that education has now become experiences. We, re we realize that you can get lots of education, lots of opportunities, and lots of everything, all those characteristics through experience. And that was one thing that we didn't have was experience. So mentorship, opportunities, resources, and now experiences. Um, on this slide here, you're looking at a picture of one of the recipients of a grant that we as more, um, we were fortunate and blessed to be able to give last year. So this is Sabrina Thompson. She is a NASA uh, engineer. So she's a rocket, a real rocket scientist. Um, but in her, when she's not working at NASA, one of the things that she's developing is a, um, a jumpsuit, a spacesuit for women, because in um, aerospace, there's not a lot of focus on women astronauts and women exploring space. So she decided that she would use her experience with NASA and her interest in science to create a suit that's specifically designed for women, where it has access pouches and things that uh, women need. And actually, Kendra is wearing uh, one of the uh, designs that uh, Sabrina was able to put together. So you can actually Google Sabrina, and she has a, um, she's been featured now on, uh, I think it's CNBC. Um, and we were able to give her a $1,500 grant and um, to help her with this work. And she's doing amazing things. And she's also a part of some of the programming that we're delivering to youth. So to date, um, just in this year, we've served 300 students, uh, youth with um, financial literacy education. Uh, just recently, we were with uh, Banneker High School with their Banneker Summer Institute. And I was uh, fortunate to be able to um, deliver a presentation, um, a pretty engaging, I think, presentation on innovation. And so we had all the kids. Imagine I had 100 kids in my group. So 100 kids in the gym. And I used um, AI, um, ChatGPT, to come up with, I, I typed in there, right on the spot, really. I typed in, I'm in a gym with 100 uh, high school students, and I want to teach them innovation. So it came up with a game, and we actually played it right there on the spot. So just showing them that you can use these tools that are out there to do some really amazing, uh, amazing things. And they had a ball with it. Um, hopefully, at some point, you can... You'll be able to go to our website and you can see some of the, uh, the activities they did with that. Um, another aspect, uh, and this is where Kendra is very passionate, and hopefully she'll have a chance to speak on it, uh, affordable housing. So our focus is on entrepreneurship, innovation, and real estate. So affordable housing is another aspect of, uh, or one of the characteristics of opportunity. 
So as we were growing and developing uh, in our, our young 20s as entrepreneurs and business owners, um, we often encountered months where the commission checks weren't coming in, right? So we were fortunate to have supportive family at that point. We didn't have the four, cho the four children. Uh, we weren't even married at that time. And um, so when we had those low months, we had somewhere to fall back on. But we also realized that housing stability is a hindrance to entrepreneurs in many cases. So that it's keeping them from wanting to step out. I'm sorry, I need to step in the, uh, the camera. Uh, from wanting to, not wanting to, but having the ability to step out and start their business. If they have to choose between um, paying the rent versus doing something with that idea they have in their head and in their heart, well, hierarchy of needs, survival is going to come first. So that's why real estate is such a big part of what we do. And it's, it's twofold. It's both home ownership, but it's also investment because real estate is a driver uh, for wealth, as you all know as well. So one of the programs that we are running currently, we've actually run a few this year. So we were uh, fortunate to get a grant with the, uh, it's hard for me to stay behind a podium. We were fortunate to get a grant with the Office of Gun Violence Prevention in DC, the mayor's office. And um, in January, we ran a program called a Valuable Life Conference. And we were able to bring in youth from across the city. And with that program, we were able to share them opportunities and technology. We were able to uh, instill in them the importance and value of life. The main premise behind this was showing that every life is significant, every life is valuable, and everyone has purpose. And it's our responsibility um, as humans to share forth that light and that uh, potential and possibility that we have. So that conference allowed us to instill those beliefs and practices into uh, youth across the city. Uh, a second opportunity we had was in, uh, I believe it was March or April, and we put on something called Tech Talk, kind of a play on two things, TikTok and TED Talk. So we came up with uh, Tech Talk. And Tech Talk, again, was um, an opportunity for us to bring not just youth, but also adults together into a room over dinner where we could discuss the future of technology and how it drives opportunity and how it can be used as a vehicle to get youth off the street, um, an opportunity for aspiring entrepreneurs to leverage some of the tools that are out there, free tools, so that they can grow a business. They may not have the biggest budget, but they do have access to things they didn't know about. And that's a, a big, uh, that's, a, that's a huge a component of what we do with resources, the R and more, just sharing opportunities and resources that are at the fingertips, literally at the fingertips of the people that we work with, because there's no reason um, that anyone right now in this world, in this economy, and in this technology-driven tech, uh, um, world that we're living in to be left behind. So that was a great opportunity there. And what I'm really excited about um, right now, and I'm going to share a prop real quick, a couple of props. So inside of this, we have sort of the soul of our organization, pun intended. So we have a, we have a, uh, a program that's starting in, uh, in this month, the end of this month, called Spacecraft. And with Spacecraft, we're going to be working with youth. Uh, we have 60 spaces. Uh, I think we're about a third full now, but they're going to be designing their own tennis shoes. So they're going to go from this to actually having shoes that they can wear. And this is for you 13 through 18 in the city. Um, so that NASA scientist, she's going to be leading that. So we're going to be using, uh, and we got a grant through DPR to be able to do this uh, programming. So we're going to be using um, cricket machines. Who's familiar with cricket machines? All right. We're going to be using cricket machines. We're going to be using um, 3D printers and traditional sewing machines and all sorts of things to, to make that happen. Um, so this is some of the materials from that. And then we have the opportunity. So what's that? You got it. <laughs> so we also have the opportunity with this program called Space, Spacecraft to be able to use uh, VR technology. Um, so with our youth, we're going to teach them not only how to use the VR technology, but also how to design their own virtual spaces. So they can design their own virtual cities. They can design their own uh, museums, their own classrooms the possibilities are endless. So we were able to get this uh, going through, um, through that grant with DPR. 
So the last thing I want to just kind of drive home. So I'm not much of a baker, but I can cook pretty well. But I made a cake not long ago that after I was done with it, it came out as sort of like a pancake. So it didn't it didn't quite turn out right. Um, but I wanted to use that experience as uh, sort of a bring to uh, bringing this all together. So going back to opportunity being the circumstances that make it possible to do something. I like to use the word ingredients, right? So imagine that you're baking a pie. I wanted to go to Whole Foods and get a pie, but I didn't have time to do that this morning. So just imagine I have a pie, right? So everyone in this room can bake a pie, but in order to do that, you have to have certain ingredients. So for the bakers in the room, I just grab what was in the pantry and available to me. So if it's not an ingredient in the pie, just imagine that it is, okay? All right, got it. So to make a pie, you may need to have some baking powder, right? That's one of the ingredients. And I imagine if you don't have the baking powder or in some cases the baking soda, your, uh, your pie crust is not gonna act right, right? But also not just ingredients, I had milk, I didn't bring it up here because I had in my mind spilling the milk, the computer and everything. So that's another ingredient, right? So I, I did bring a tool. So if you're baking a, a pie and you're really making it from scratch, which I like to try to do, you may need to have the right tools so that you can roll out the, the dough so that you can get your crust. So when we think about um, thriving and we think about opportunity, so when we have not just youth, but also adults, as we work together to build opportunities for uh, those who may not have historically had the opportunities to bake that pie, think of that pie as thriving. Let's call it Thrive Pie. Right. So in order to have Thrive Pie, you need the right tools and you need the right ingredients. So working together um, and hopefully coming alongside with more, we'll work together to make sure that youth, adults, seniors, men, women, what have you, have the opportunity, the ingredients and the tools to make that pie possible. So that's uh, I think that's the presentation. So I think I'm ready for questions. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, I saw you kind of skipped over the real estate slide, and I had a yeah. question about housing opportunity. I think most people in this country don't realize the extent to which racial segregation in housing has been and today still is enforced by law. And there is an argument, at least, that the single best thing we could do to create housing opportunity for everybody would be to abolish the residential zoning laws. What do you think? Okay. Well, I will say um, a few things on that. So yes, historically, um, and how many of you know redlining, eminent domain, right? So we've actually personally been um, in, been impacted by um, eminent domains. We actually, um, so Kendra's aunt in uh, North Carolina in Wilmington, um, for example, as well as your mother, um, and, sister, and, and aunts, right? Yeah. So in two separate cases, their land they've had for, I don't know how many years. So we're 90 plus years, right? almost 100 years. That land has now been, um, we'll say confiscated, but through imminent, imminent domain has been removed from the family. Stolen. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So it's been it's been taken from the family. So that's an opportunity for that much land would have been an opportunity for development, for putting tiny houses on there or, or lots of other things, agriculture, what have you. So historically, that has happened. Um, Kendra is our real estate champion, uh, so she can speak more on that as well. But um, I'm going to invite her up. But definitely, I think there's opportunity for um, changes in, in zoning. I don't have a, a a full conclusion on that as my as I'm studying and experiencing. However, I will say this: I do think that we um, there are some regulations that should be adjusted. I think that we focus, particularly in the district, we focus too much on big, um, you know, rental apartments. And I think the way to change affordable housing issues is to make sure that people have the opportunity to purchase. If you can compare the number of rental units being built versus the number of uh, houses own, uh, ownership being built, it doesn't compare. It really doesn't compare. My thought, we need to focus on missing middle, right? Or, is anyone familiar with the term Alice or missing middle? 
Missy Middle, that is the um, term to describe those four units to eight units to 10 units that we that you used to see, right? And the owner would live in one and then you rent the other. What does that do? That one, it helps the owner build wealth, right? And the owner is typically not, you know, Bazuto. I love Bazuto, you know, if you, you know, I lived in Bazuto, but, you know, at the same time, Bazuto is a huge company. Sorry, folks online. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's huge. But if you know, if I have a mom pa shop, which is the equivalent of a four to eight to 10 unit building, they can build well, right? And those opportunities need to be created for people who have been um, historically underrepresented or, you know, disadvantaged. There's so many names floating out for the group, you know. Um, they would have more opportunity to, one, build wealth, Two, have better impact or a say or what's going on inside their community. Three, the tenants have more control and they have better relationships with their owners. They have the opportunity for that, right? So when we start to focus on not having commercial zones and having places where um, everyone can, we can focus our efforts not just on big, huge de box development, then we can really build our community so that everyone's growing. One of the other things I want to say about um, the missing middle type of housing, it doesn't have to necessarily be, you know, so many units. For instance, one of the um, projects that we're hoping to get, hoping to get is um, the ability to build up what we call multi-generational housing, right? So it might be kind of like the brownstones in New York, right? You know, you get your three levels and you have one person live, I mean, one family living in each, right? But um, Today, you could have grandma and grandpa in, the, in one unit and, you know, the family. And that also, even though you may not be renting it out to someone else, that helps with the family expenses because grandma and grandpa are, you know, getting help in the family, you know, in the same house. Everybody's resources are going into the same home. You know, child, they can help with the kids, that kind of thing, right? The other thing is, if you have a house with the, uh, you know, they used to call them English basements, those can be used for Airbnb, quite frankly, short-term rentals, right? Or long-term rentals. There's so many options we can put, implement when it comes to building missing middle housing that, um, you know, we're just not doing because we're so focused on 300 unit rentals, apartment buildings. I saw two hands. I saw one and two. Oh. Hi, uh, my name is Christian. My question: So, when you look across the three pillars of your organization, what, uh, how would you define success, and what are your uh, objectives for your organization to thrive across those three pillars? That's very. That's an awesome question. So, we think of holistic wellness, right? We're very holistic in everything we do, um, and if if our if our families, our individuals, or whomever are able to go through. Um, the process and just improve something, right? You know, like you just leave one where you started, you leave better than where you started, right? So all of our program, you know, so some might seem completely unrelated, but to us it's completely related because we're thinking of the family holistically. Your teenagers are in spacecraft learning how to make their sneakers. They take their sneakers and they begin to put, um, to start their own business. They can put that business right in the, um, for a unit building, can't they, right? You know, you see this all related. It doesn't have to be, um, and we're not trying to do it all, but we're all trying to look at the whole list. We see the, the forest, not just the trees, right? So I hope that answers your, your question. We see thriving as moving people out of paycheck to paycheck, you know? We don't want you to have to figure out where your next meal is coming from. We're not looking for everybody to be rich. That's not what we define as abundant life. We are looking for everyone to just be able to take a day off if they need to so they can, you know, evaluate their mental health. You know what I mean? So it's all about how can we help the holistic individual and that individual will become a better, make uh, the, the different individuals, individuals, sorry, folks, um, will help the people in the family nucleus, in the nucleus, the community and so forth, the community and so forth. Uh, yes. Yes. Hi. So I'm Mariama. And I guess my question is, as someone who's passionate about real estate investing, with your target group, marginalized communities, what are the basic, I guess, programs or activities that you have under real estate that's educating these communities on how to enter into real estate? So I'm, I'm more curious about the basic foundations of your real estate business model. You know, I worked as a realtor for a decade. And part of the reason I got into this is because I was, you know, I almost felt like I was part of the problem because 
I worked with investors who were actually buying properties that I might have brought to them. And then, you know, they renovated and I might have sold them. It's my shame. I've exposed myself. But that that became, how can you do that? How can we do that? How can I help the owner to fix their own house first? Here's a perfect example. In 2020, was that? 2020, a lady came to me. She was from Florida, but she owned a property in Maryland. And uh, her husband, it's, it's kind of a sad story, but it ends, you know, on a better note. So in Florida, her husband committed suicide. Her children were taken from her. She was left without a home. They lost the home that they were living in in, Flor- in foreclosure. She comes to Maryland because she knows he has this house in Maryland. And this particular house is occupied by a tenant who's not paying rent. So now she's getting foreclosure notices for her house. Well, finally, the tenant, you know, who didn't pay for a year, um, that particular tenant leaves um, the house and we go into it. The house is a mess. Nobody's wanting to buy it. Only one who wants to buy it is an investor. Uh, and they were waiting. If we did it, we would have to do a short sale if we sold it. I said, okay, all right. Now this is before more. So this isn't a more, but this is the type of thing that we do. Partnered with her, helped her rent it, get her house to a point of sale she ended up getting 350 for the house instead of the 295 someone was asking and was able to walk away from that transaction with $10,000 in her pocket pocket to find a place to live because she was homeless, right? Essentially. So that is how we, one of the things, the second thing, now this is controversial. You know, some people are for it. Some people are against, against it. I'm all about just, you know, let's moving people forward, but housing vouchers. Housing vouchers have been used to keep people in the cycle of renting, right? Well, that housing voucher can actually pay for a mortgage. Why aren't we getting that housing voucher, pay for the mortgage, and to make sure that they can continue to afford it, take out $200 a month or whatever portion of their housing voucher possible that's not going toward their mortgage, and save it for a rainy day fund. So now $200 of your your housing voucher is in a rainy day fund each month, so that when the roof goes out, you have the money to pay for it, right? So we're thinking outside of the box to come up with solutions with what resources are actually available. But very few people actually talk about the fact or actually take people through it because it's not easy. It's not like you can take your housing, housing voucher right to the uh, bank and say, hey, give me a house, right? It's not. It takes a little work. You got to get your credit right and all that other stuff. But we can prepare you for that or it directs you to resources. So, for instance, MANA. MANA is an existing organization. Um, there's another one. Sorry, what else is escaping me right now. But those type of organizations exist, which offer housing counseling. We are not yet licensed to be a housing counselor, but we, you know, might do that. We don't want to overwhelm ourselves, but we might go ahead and do that. I've taught home ownership classes because, I, like I said, I was doing it for 10 years. So, I mean, for 13 years, something like that. Thank you again. Thank you for having us. Oh, man. This was very, thank you so much, uh, Kendra and Jason. This was awesome. And I really want to give with the VR. Stay here, stay here, stay here, stay here, stay here. So um, we have a tradition that we give. Our club gives a tree um, in your name on the Capitol 